have these parts of ourselves that, that are sort of lying in wait and that often go unused or that you know have sort of smaller parts occupy smaller parts of our lives hidden parts of our lives and then a lot depends on circumstance what happens who we meet what we come across accidents uh, to see what sort of what what connects with or activates certain parts of ourselves uh, and you know inside of each of us I think there are many possible lives and you know would my how different would my life be if I hadn't had this accident I, there's really no way so no, I think a lot of things would have I think I would probably still be a writer. I think I would have gone to some place remote at some point, but would, have, would I have lived for two years in the woods? Probably not. I just wanted to uh, welcome you all to the second installment of our Get Lit After Work series that we're doing at Fanel Home Marketplace. And uh, I'm very pleased that our second installment brings Howard Axelrod, who uh, has been a, a long-time instructor at Grub Street and at Emerson, and um, a long-time Boston resident. I'm going to start by reading the prologue, which is just um, to give you a, a sense of where I where I was uh, in Vermont, what the house was like, um, and hopefully that will orient you in the story, and then also disorient you somewhat. The house wasn't something you stumbled upon by accident. It wasn't something you passed going anywhere else. To get there, you drove through Glover, Vermont, a general store, no traffic light, one busy bee diner, climbed along switchbacks through maples, evergreens, and birches, then turned left onto a wide dirt road. You passed the barn and blue silo of the Moreland Dairy Farm, snaked past a few scattered houses and trailers, then followed deeper into the woods, the maples tapped, tubed, and strung together like prisoners on a chain gang as it was early March now, sugar season. A few miles in, at a mailbox nobody used, you forked off the wide dirt road onto an unmaintained narrow lane, the deeper snow tugging at your car as though part of a different gravity. You slipped through a tunnel of overhanging trees, came to an empty field bordered by tall pines, then passed an uninhabited house, its siding job left unfinished, then followed as the road dwindled into what seemed only the ghost of a road no car tracks but your own, the twin trail in the snow behind you like a vestige of the two ruts in summer when the weeds between them would grow taller than your hood. A small meadow opened on your left, three gnarled apple trees glimmering in the sunlight like chandeliers, and beyond the meadow was the beginning again of forest with little promise of a house at all. From there, just inside the buried fence posts, you walked, and at the bottom of the steep grade, with its sky blue paint flaking, its lines badly canted, sat the two-story house like a sunken ship. Not much from the outside world found me there. In the year and a half since I moved in, there had never been a knock on the door. I had no television, no computer, no cell phone. There was a landline which rang maybe twice a month, so a wrong number was an event. As for other news, the yellowing issues of the Newport Chronicle stacked in the corner by the wood stove, reported on beaver problems, church suppers, DWI charges, and missing dogs, but all from years past. Sometimes, kindling the fire's embers at dawn, I'd find myself wondering about a handsome spotted pointer or the cutest darn black mutt you ever saw. But then I'd notice the newspaper's date. Those dogs had lighted out for their canine dreams two summers earlier, long before the snows. The only news that didn't reach me with a kind of ghostliness came through the house's windows or from my daily walks up into the woods. Clouds wrestling on a blustery afternoon, sunlight opening through the birches as though from behind a curtain, slow flurries descending towards dusk. And about once a week, if the roads were clear, I'd make the drive down into the town of Barton for groceries at the C&C, then up the curving road to the Lake Parker General Store. West Glover's tiny post office hid at the back of the store, as though it had once been the town's tiny bank. The young woman behind the counter was no more than 18, lovely and bovine in her slowness. She would walk the dirt-worn floorboards very deliberately, past the cooler full of milk, past the six packs of beer, past the canned goods, then enter the post office and check the box for general delivery. Not wanting to make her any more self-conscious or myself any more aware of what it would mean to be alone with a woman again, I'd wait up at the counter. When she returned, she'd blush like something blooming in one of those time-lapse nature movies. 
the red rising up her neck, then her cheek, the blush all the more vivid when there was no male for me. Maybe this was because I looked something like a wild animal, shaggy beard, eyes too intense. Or maybe it was just because my voice had gone unused since my last trip to the store, and when I thanked her, too much feeling was stored up inside it. Even to me, my words seemed to come from far away, as though they required travel time, like light from a distant star. So on that moonless March night, my three raps came at the mudroom door. Surprise wasn't the word for my response. Each rap sounded alarmingly inside the house, hardening the posts and beams into place. A current ran through my body, a rattling physical charge. The blue candle guttered on the table. It seemed I was underwater and something was bobbing on the surface far above me. In the darkened windows to the woods, the reflection of my dinner flickered soft and shadowy, more the idea of a dinner than anything solid. And my image flickered just the same. On my weekly trip to the CNC, I was prepared knowing I would be seen. Reflections, however, glancing would be cast back at me from the checkout girl snapping her gum, hippie, from the bulky matrons trundling their carts, drifter. Reflections bearable because they seemed so obviously wrong. But the thought of someone there, as close as the mudroom door, was like a mirror flashed close to my face. A man alone, a barely furnished room, a candle on the table. It seemed like an ancient interrogation, but with no visible interrogator. The downstairs bathroom did have a mirror, but I never confronted it. Not brushing my teeth, not washing my face, not stepping out of the shower. Not because I minded my face itself, or even my blind right eye, which had developed a pearly green cataract since my accident but because the gaunt 25-year-old man in the mirror was no one I recognized. A figure was there, a physical presence, but he followed me only at a distance. Even keeping a journal had, had come to feel strange, as though I was trying to sketch my own outline to crowd the wind, the snow, and the stars into the shape of a man. Coming to the woods hadn't been an exercise or a retreat. It wasn't something to take notes on and jar for later, like summer berries. I needed to live without the need of putting on a face for anyone including myself. I needed to be no one really while carrying the hope that my particular no one might feel familiar, might turn out to be someone I had known all along, the core of who I'd been as a boy, the core of who I might become as a man. Beneath all the masks I'd accumulated over the years, beneath even the masks that resented those masks, there had to be something there, something essential, some sense of reality and of myself that couldn't be broken. The knocking came again, the same three sharp raps, Standing frozen by the wood stove, I pictured the night outside. The last stretch of road to the house so narrow, the snow six feet deep, the passage like a bobsled run. The darkness mitigated only by the stars. The only people I'd seen in the nearby hills, apart from Nat and his son, who occasionally came to plow the unmaintained lane, were deer hunters. But hunting season was months gone. The winter sun had long since set. Whoever was at the door had to be more frightened than I was. If there was a crazy man in the woods, a wild bearded loner liable to do anything, I was him. I am the crazy man. I am the crazy man. It was the same thing I told myself so many times hearing a branch snap in the woods or the stairs creak in the middle of the night. I am the crazy man. I am the crazy man. Usually it hardened my fear into something like resolve. But now I couldn't help picturing a middle-aged man in a checkable jacket slouching at the door a glowing cigarette in one hand, a rifle in the other, and no deer for miles. The three raps came again, more insistent. It was probably an emergency. Someone was probably in need. Smoke was rising from my chimney. Candlelight spilled out onto the snow. There really wasn't much of a choice. I stepped into my moccasins, crossed the plywood mudroom floor, and opened the door. So I, I, thank you. So I, I realized as I was reading that, what's that? We didn't do the setup of why you went to the woods. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't talk about why I went to the woods, although it's sort of suggested in there. But, but what I was thinking about was just how friggin' hot it is tonight and how, what a, a demand on the imagination it is to try to picture all this snow and all this silence. It's also somewhat noisy where we are. So it, it's sort of the antithesis of where I, was and to try to imagine that stillness and that quiet and how alarming a knock would be on the door in this area is quite a quite a demand so thanks for giving thanks for giving it your all 
Um, the, the question of what drove me to the woods or what precipitated it, um, as I mentioned in the, in the prologue, there was an eye accident when I was a junior in college. Uh, I played, I was at Harvard, I went to play some pickup basketball. I played a lot of basketball as a kid. And um, it, was, it was a week before finals, I was just going to blow off some steam. And a, a boy's finger went into my eye. Um, we, were, we were just scurrying for a, for a rebound. And his finger curved behind my eye and severed the optic nerve, which is the cable that connects the eye to the brain. Um, and after that, in a, obviously in a, you know, in a physical way, everything looked different. But then also sort of in a, in, a, uh, in a metaphysical way. I mean, suddenly I was sort of outside my life. I, could, I, I had a, a glimpse um, as though, you know, if you picture a house cut in half, um, I suddenly had, you can see the infrastructure, you can see the beams, you can see the supports. And I suddenly seemed to have that with my own life. On the way to the hospital, I was in a cabin, it happened to be rush hour, we got stuck in traffic. And I remember looking across the river and seeing all the Harvard buildings lined up over there and being aware of what would be happening if I were still at school, um, I, who I would be going to have dinner with. And I, I just felt as though I was sort of, that, that my life over there was more real than the shadow I had become. And even when I went back to school, I had that sort of vision of my life from the outside, which is something that allows you to question the infrastructure of your life, to question what are the tacit assumptions. Um, and eventually, a couple years later, I, I went to the Wits to try to address those questions as, as directly as possible. Um, I'm just going to read one more short passage. I, I think we'll do better with, with Q&A and with conversation, given the surroundings. But um, one thing that, that really changes when you spend time in solitude is, is your sense of time uh, and how time passes. And so I'm going to read this little section. This is just, uh, it, uh, it starts off by talking about in the morning, I, every morning I would make the fire to stay warm. I, I had a wood stove and then I would make some tea. So it's just talking about that and then sort of my, my sense of time. It also it mentions Bologna because the year after I graduated from college I lived in Bologna. But that's, that's about all you need to know, I think. So again, this is, this is in the morning making the fire and then making tea. I took my time. The loneliness often felt as though the day was slow and I was stuck outside that slowness looking in. The way to feel less lonely was to slow down to the day's pace to be inside it and to look around from there. The clean, almost sharp waft of mint would cool behind my eyes, mint tea. With each hot sip, there was the compliment of the wood smoke on my hands as though I'd brewed the tea over a peat fire. Behind me, the wood popped, shifted, hissed. I can't say how long any of this took, maybe 10 minutes drinking the cup of tea, maybe longer. There was no clock in the house, no microwave numerals, no computer. No sense of time other than the daylight through the windows and my own sense of pattern. Finding my hand on the kettle just as it began to tremble or stepping outside to find the sun, a white hole in the clouds above the highest spruce. There had always been clocks in classrooms, clocks on walls, clocks in public spaces, clocks like the digital one above Albumpan and Harvard Square or the famous clock tower in Piazza Maggiore clocks as ubiquitous as the portraits in China of Chairman Mao or of Lenin in Russia. Not to mention the watches on nearly every wrist in Harvard Yard, nearly every wrist in Bologna, individual watches to make time's face resemble your own, while we were all joined by common time, the common progression, which we were assured of by the bells tolling at one church or another. There was undoubtedly something true about it. The light did come and go, the sun did rise and set, the moon did change its shape in the sky. And meanwhile, we all got older. Time passed. I'd never given it much thought, but now it seemed bizarre that we'd managed to shrink something so profoundly primal and complex, something so near and so far, into little circular frames with numbers up to 12. It was like we had domesticated the planetary motions, housed them in convenient cages, harnessed them as farm animals to help with our daily work. We needed them for lunch meetings, we needed them for parking meters. Every night, we slipped the turning of the earth from our wrists. The few stars in Boston, I realize now, have been like 
few stores in Boston I realized now have been like worn out horses back in their stalls. Their quiet snuffling in the dark, their unassuming beauty, so much greater than the use to which they've been put. But here the stars ran wild, with the overwhelming profusion of them, with the visible sweep of the Milky Way, it seemed there were more stars than sky. Time was everywhere, not minutes and hours, not days and weeks, but seasons, centuries, millennia. Time was so much bigger in wild places, and feeling them reunited, time and space, I felt returned to some natural element, like a fish returned to water. Before my accident, my preferred clock had always been other people, Hearing my brother flushing the toilet in the morning meant I needed to rouse myself for school. Hearing footsteps pounding down the stairwell in Adams meant I was mount, bound to miss breakfast. Hearing the whir of the street cleaner on Via Inario meant I only had a few more hours before, we had to, before she had to steal back upstairs. But now my sense of time came only from the sun and the stars and from the time it took for the water to boil, for the fire to catch. There, was no other, there, there were no other people, no other clocks, Maybe this was what pushed my morning towards feeling like a ritual, towards the sense that kindling the fire, making the tea, and even walking outside weren't just morning activities, but a way of participating in something larger, some community not of people, but of the natural world, a community that, helped, that might help me find my own resemblance to time, my own rhythm as a part of its rhythm, an orientation beyond a face or a name. All right, thanks. So I think we should open it to questions, or do you want to? Yeah, well, you, you write very beautifully about um, your senses becoming more attuned uh, to sound, um, to slowness, in a way that you, you would never be able to afford to have your senses out of tune in an environment like this. <laughs> right, exactly. Coming back to the city. And so, and I'm sorry, I think there's some. My senses are attuned to some buzzing happening over there, so I apologize for that. Um, but I just wondered if you could talk about um, the challenge of re-entry. I think all of us sort of fantasize about um, escaping to the woods, and especially now because we are so plugged in. Like, how do you slow down? Um, and so I just wondered about you know how you were able to return from that. Uh, coming back was, was really difficult. It was much harder than going. The, the letting go of um, all the layers of sound and speed is, was fairly easy for me. But coming back felt like a bombardment. Um, for about two years, whenever I would walk down the street, I would wear earplugs. Just because my, um, not only had my hearing grown more acute, but I think more, um, more pertinent is that I lost the filters on my senses. So when you're walking down the street, or, or now, when you're <laughs> sitting here, uh, if you're able to block out all the all the sounds around us and, and focus on you know what's happening just here, um, and I, I lost that ability because when when you're in the woods, you want to hear everything there is to hear. You want to see everything there is to see. If there's a sound in the woods, it means something might be coming towards you. <laughs> um, so you want to. There's nothing you don't want to be aware of. But generally, if you're walking down the street, you, you don't want to be aware of almost everything. The only thing you want to be aware of is the friend who's talking to you or the phone call you're in the midst of. And you're, you're actually, it's sort of incredible how, how good we all are at filtering everything else out. Um, I completely lost that ability, not that I was probably ever great at it, but I, I certainly lost that ability. So when I came back, um, just dealing with public spaces was, was really hard. I just wanted to ask, like, how after you returned and even still today, how important it is for you to get away, to if you do go back to the woods frequently, or, or how you can find like pockets of, of quiet among you know living in a city. It, it's still it's still important. I mean, it, it's still a way for me to re. Um, I was going to say recharge, which is uh, obviously a technological metaphor. A, a way to feel. Um, strong again. I just on the on the subway ride in. I was reading some poems by Seamus Haney, and he has one that, where he talks about Antaeus. And, I, and the myth of Antaeus is that he, his powers come from him being connected to the earth. And as soon as he as soon as he's ripped up out of the earth, he loses all his powers. And I and I think Haney wrote it because he for him that's how he 
felt as a poet that his poetry, I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with his poetry, it's obviously very connected to the physical world. And I, and I feel something akin to that, uh, that if I don't return every so often, I, yeah, I feel like I'm losing, like the city in some way is, is kryptonite and I'm losing, losing whatever powers I have. So, but on the other hand, there are ways, I think, to, to build some silence around you. And so every morning I go for a walk and I, I don't live downtown, but I still live more or less in the city. And, but I make sure on my walk to just try to just pay attention the way I tried to pay attention when I was in the woods. Um, and that kind of slowness, that kind of clearing out of the mind and just sort of trying to be as sort of the slowest thing that's happening so you're able to see everything else that's happening around you is a way of generating a certain kind of stillness or silence around you um, and by sort of it's easy to forget how variable our attention is uh, and if you become practiced at sort of changing your own attention and making it larger uh, and, and sort of slower in the way an athlete's attention has to become slower when things are moving really fast um, if you're able to do that sort of in your daily life, it, it's a way of building sort of more space around you or more stillness around you. And I, I so that that works too, but only so long. And then I, yeah, I have to get back to the words. Um, how did you decide to uh, use your experience to write a memoir as opposed to say fiction? So when I went to the woods, I didn't think I was going to write about it at all. I never had any plan to write about it. And then in the years afterwards, um, an editor approached me about about doing some nonfiction book, some sort of long form narrative nonfiction book. And I kept saying I don't have I don't have a story. You know, I kept sort of looking for some great story that I could research for whatever a year or so, and and I couldn't find one. And part of it was my worry that I would superimpose my story onto whatever story I was going to tell. And then I met with this editor and I said oh I do you know I did live kind of a strange life I lived in the woods for two years and his eyes kind of bugged out and um, and he said you know you could try to do it as a novel or, a, or as a memoir but the thing is for for a novel you need some action and there's really very very little action and uh, and the tension is so interior you know it's, it's, a, it's a book of searching and there, there is there is a lot of tension but it's really interior and and I think memoir is kind of made for that. Memoir is made for if you've had some sort of before and after moment in your life where something happens and then your life changes in that instant and everything that happened, sort of the way your life was before is not, that bridge is broken. You can't really get back to the way it was before. The effort to make sense of that, you know, the, the effort to try to understand, to, to reorient and then to try to make sense of that reorientation is, I, I think, intrinsically a kind of memoir project. Uh, had I wanted to have, uh, you know, a, a wrestling match with a bear and have my arm chewed off and get into some gunfights with some local hunters and maybe that would have worked for a really, a really bad novel. Uh, but what I was up to, it, it, the, I mean, I, I wasn't much of a memoir reader actually, in part because the memoir boom had happened not that long before I went to the woods, or sort of around that time, and there were a lot of crappy memoirs. And um, but the more I read and the more I thought about my own story, it, was, it really was sort of ready-made for that for that genre to, to to try to make meaning. I mean, I think so often that's what pulls us towards towards memoirs is, is that the effort to make meaning of, of your own life, uh, and especially the harder parts or the the less communicable parts of your own life, uh, and that sometimes works in a novel but often requires a lot more shooting and tension you know and, and sort of a physical outward tension so that that's why I did it as a memoir. Can you talk a little bit about technology and how that has sort of probably changed from the time that you were able to come back and it's so fast and that's a lot of things that are so fast and aggressive. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that impresses me about Howard's writers is not on Twitter, and a lot of writers are feeling they have to be. He also doesn't have a cell phone, so. <laughs> I just got a flash. You know that scene, that Woody Allen movie where he's sitting at the dinner with the, with um, Diane 
Keaton's character's family, and they see him with like a black hat and a long beard. <laughs> and as you all were saying, and I suddenly like now I'm gonna appear to you like an Amish, and I've got my long coat, and I parked my horses around the, around the corner. <laughs> so now I, I don't have a cell phone. Um, for to answer Miriam's question, yeah. So I, I was in the woods '99 to 2001, and when I went. It was something like a quarter of the population had cell phones, but when I came back, more than half did. So um, I felt like Rip Van Winkle. I mean, I came back and things had changed. It felt like I've been gone two years, but it really felt like 20 because things had changed so much. Suddenly people are talking to their hands as they walk down the street and people are yelling, but there's no one there for them to be yelling at. And maybe that wasn't so different, but um, th there were lots of things that, that were had changed. Also, not long after I came back was 9-11. Was um, and so so now there are news flashes everywhere. Anxiety is really high for, you know, and very justified um, reasons. And the, the, the crawl at the bottom of, you know, like in CNN or cable news, before then that had only been used for weather alerts or for flashing news. But 9-11 uh, was when that became permanent. And so suddenly the, the visual rhetoric was louder. It was just more. I mean, and now, of course, we're really aware of that kind of thing with the with the election season. But right around that is when things got louder, faster. Uh, people were sort of accessible everywhere, um, and I think our you know our sense of public and private was changing for sure because every public space was no longer really a public space because it was also a private space, and private spaces were no longer really private because you were also always accessible, so it was also really public. So that was kind of eroding at that time, um, and and I think our sense of time was was changing because if you're, for instance, if you have a routine every morning like I do with my, well, whatever your routine is, you go, you get a cup of coffee, or uh, if you're doing that, but you're also always on your phone or you're always sort of available, you're not, uh, you're you're stuck in a kind of timelessness. You're not sort of, you're not even in the sort of the time of your routine which connects you to the, you know, to all the other mornings you went and got your coffee and all the mornings in the future. There's something, comfort, routine gets a bad rap. There's something really comforting about having that, that same thing you do because it connects you to all the other times you did that thing. But if you're always on your phone and you're sort of stuck in this timeless, placeless frame of reference, then you, you, you lose even that. So yeah, it was, uh, it was doubly hard for me to come back, or, or maybe exponentially hard for me to come back when I did because things really were changing. So the implication is, and I think whoever has not read it, the implication is sort of that you went to the woods because you had this eye injury. And I've read the book and I've talked about it, and I know that's not going to be the case. And um, so I kind of wonder whether you know, not everybody in the world could do that. There's no question about that. So there's something in your DNA in particular that, you know, some people go in the woods and panic in two seconds and run away because they just can't deal with it. But you have something in your DNA that allows you to be, have that solitude and enjoy it and slow your life down. But I'm kind of wondering whether you think, even without the eye accident, you would have ended up in the woods at some point because that was just sort of the way that you finally came to understand yourself. So I, I was definitely coming to some kind of crossroads, or maybe even a kind of collision, you know, which is a more violent way of saying crossroads. Uh, but I don't know if it would have been so extreme. I mean, I, I was at that, before the accident, a kind of closeted reader. I really liked reading, and I didn't quite understand why I liked it so much. I wasn't comfortable with that part. I, I liked to read and I liked to write, which seemed like two really warped things to like to do. Um, my family, there, there weren't really readers in my family, there certainly weren't any artists in my family, and uh, I didn't quite know how to make sense of that part of myself. I, the part of myself that I felt comfortable was the part that went to play basketball, you know, it was the part that watched the Celtics uh, on our bookshelf when I was growing up, on the bookshelf, and the, there were some books, but there was, all, there was also a basketball signed by Larry Bird and Dr. J, there was also a basketball signed by John Havlicek. Those were the masterpieces on our bookshelves and not books. And, and those were really, I mean, for me too, that's what I valued most about what was on those bookshelves. When someone came over, I would say, do you want to see the basketball signed by Larry Bird? I would not say, do you want to see an old edition of War and Peace or whatever. So, so that it was hard for me. 
you know, the more I recognize that something in me felt at home, you know, reading and writing, that part of my that part of myself didn't have any place to fit in my actual home. That was that was tricky, and so I think I was kind of waiting until college graduation or sometime after then to tell my parents I definitely wasn't going to become a lawyer and I wasn't going to become a sports agent or whatever, uh, and I was going to have to deal with it at some point. So so it's not as though the accident created like a new me, you know, like some part of me that hadn't existed before, but it is as though it catalyzed or opened up a part of myself that I hadn't quite known how to open up myself. I mean, I think we all have that. I think we all have these parts of ourselves that, that are sort of lying in wait and that often go unused or that, you know, have sort of smaller parts, occupy smaller parts of our lives, hidden parts of our lives. And then a lot depends on circumstance. What happens, who we be, what we come across, accidents, uh, to see what sort of, what, what connects with or activates certain parts of ourselves. Uh, and you know, inside of each of us, I think there are many possible lives. And you know, would my how different would my life be if I hadn't had this accident? I, there's really no way to know. I think a lot of things would have. I think I would probably still be a writer. I think I would have gone to some place remote at some point. But would, have, would I have lived for two years in the woods? Probably not. At what point you said before that you think you were going to write? You had intended to write about this experience. When did that change for you, and how did you decide on the structure for the book? This, this may sound odd, but it was only once I got back and had been back for maybe a, a year or two that I realized just how strange going to the woods was. I mean, it, it, when I went, it felt pretty natural to me. It felt pretty, it seemed just like the obvious choice. Of course, of course, that's what you do. And then when I came back, it became clear that that was a very strange thing to have done. And not only did I not know how to explain it to other people, but I, I realized I didn't really know how to explain it to myself. I mean, I, I didn't know how to, how to make meaning of it. I didn't know how to fit it into the rest of my life. And I, I remember reading, I think this, it was the poet Cheshwa Milo, she said that dignity uh, is the ability to carry your past comfortably. And, and, and I wanted to be able to do that. I wanted to be able to do it in a way that it didn't feel like this sort of um, break in my life or this thing that didn't have to do with the rest of my life. And. So, I mean, part of it was being asked by that editor to do, you know, sort of seeing his interest, but I think part of it was recognizing that if I, and this is a, a sort of a strange thought, but I realized, like, if I ever have kids, how am I going to explain this to them? Because it's just such a bizarre thing. And I, and I realized that, that in some way that was a projection of myself and, to, you know, how will I explain this to myself in the future? And I thought, oh, this is really important. I really do need to, to understand what I was doing and have a way of, making sense of it so then it could enrich the rest of my life because otherwise it's just sort of a you know a side door a, a commercial or something and I, and I really wanted it to be more of a foundation for everything going forward and also have a way of understanding how it connected with everything that had come before uh, and then you said how did I figure out how to structure it with great pain I mean it, that was really hard that was really hard because I was under the misapprehension that if I just wrote it cleanly and had nice sentences and the nice paragraphs, that I would make for a nice story, and it doesn't work that way. Um, so it, it took a while, and, and I, I, a writer friend helped me out. We started talking about different scenes and how we might interlace the, the story of being in the woods with the eye accident, and then also um, the love story part, how we might use that too. And I actually, so I'm, I'm, I'm moving soon, so I've been packing up my apartment, and I came across one of the note cards I had used for one of the scenes. And so I, I laid out the whole book on note cards for every single scene, and had little stickers for whether it was part of the, the eye accident story, or part of the Italy story, or part of the wood story. Blue, red, and yellow. And I, out of one of my books, fell this index card that had the blue sticker on it, and it said, I actually used the real name for the, for the woodman. But it, it said, he says, are you going to stay? And then, yeah, you're going to be here. It's a scene at the end of chapter one, I think. And there it was on the, on the note card. And it, you know, it's, it was so weird to think that I actually, and it, of course it makes perfect sense, but that I, I have the whole book in note cards. And the whole, it's like this little puzzle that I had to figure out how to put together. And when I just did the note cards, they just looked like 
no cards with stickers, and I thought, oh crap, I don't know if this is. But now looking back, it looks like, oh, all you have to do is add some water, and poof, you get, you know, instant, instant book. It's a pretty simple question, so if your answer is no, so don't feel obligated to say anything else. But did you ever feel like you were losing your mind? It could just be yes. No. No, I, I didn't. Uh, which might be a, which might be an indication that I was <laughs> sort of you know that I that I wasn't aware of how far out I'd gone and how dangerous things got. And it was only in retrospect um, that I was really concerned about myself. You know that I realized how risky it was and how how far out some of my thinking was getting. But I never heard voices. I never felt compelled to. I don't know, draw messages in the snow for <laughs> creatures above or nothing like that ever happened. But I did just when I was cleaning up my apartment, I found some old poems from when I was first there. And some of them I can't, I mean, I wrote them. I can't tell what the, what the hell they're saying, which isn't necessarily bad, but there, there's something, they're really enigmatic. And it's like there was some sort of, I was getting into a kind of headspace or something that, that I think was, um, I don't think I was going mad, but that, that was a, that was really unusual and sort of hard, even for me looking back at it, sort of hard to understand. But at the time, I didn't feel that, you know, I felt pretty good. Uh, and only in retrospect do I think, oh, it was, you know, there were probably some times there where it was getting a little close to it, some edge that I might have slipped off. I think um, one of the reasons we read memoir is to sort of benefit from the insights of someone who's taken on an experience that we haven't had or would feel ourselves too scared to be. And I think as much as a lot of us fantasize about moving out uh, to the wilderness or spending two years in solitude, the reality is frightening. So I just want to thank you for giving us the wisdom and insights of you know, sharing that with us through the, your um, book and also this brief talk. So um, Howard's going to move to the back corner for those who want to buy his book. Um, everyone, please put, put your hands together and think. Thank you. So wonderful. Pinky, eyes welling with tears, opened her mouth again and a wave of hiccups came out, frantic and loud. Tom Jr. shook his head. He went into the house while everyone watched and returned with the Stockham cane. It was twice his length, made of a dull birch wood. It wasn't thick, but it was so heavy that Tom Jr. could hardly hold it with both of his hands, let alone the one it would take to snap it back. 